I'm going to begin today with my take home message, which is that sex hormones do a lot more than regulate our reproductive function. Sex hormones can influence our mood, influence our cognition in both health and in disease. Today I'm going to talk about um, menstrual cycle changes in hormones and how that influences mood and cognition. The contraceptive pill, what we can learn from that. What happens during menopause and healthy aging processes. And then I'm going to switch to talk about a disease model, schizophrenia, and the role of hormones in schizophrenia, and the potential for hormones as interventions for some of the symptoms of schizophrenia. So some of the interest in sex hormones has come from the profound sex differences that are seen in the prevalence rates and presentations of a range of different neuropsychiatric disorders. For example, in Alzheimer's disease, two thirds of people are female, and at the other end of the spectrum in autism, three quarters of people with autism are male. These sex differences can be attributed to numerous factors that include cultural factors, environmental factors, genetic factors, chromosome factors, and also sex hormones, which is what I'm interested in and Jaytree and our team are interested in the role of sex hormones. So I should point out that I'm speaking in today's talk about female sex hormones, but, or sex hormones in females, but obviously males have sex hormones as well that also influence mood and disease states and symptoms and a whole range of different things in males, but I'm just focusing on females for this talk. So sex hormones are in, uh, regulated by the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal or HPG axis. And this negative feedback loop regulates hormones such as estrogen, progesterone, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. And most of the research that's been conducted on hormones has been conducted on estradiol. So estradiol is the main form of estrogen that circulates in women who are of a reproductive age. And most of the research has come from animal models and that's how we've learned a lot about the actions of estradiol on the brain. So I'll just go into a little bit of science. So estradiol can act on intracellular estrogen receptors where it can act on, just see if this, where it can um, act to regulate gene expression and protein synthesis and then can act on a range of different neurotransmitter pathways. So dopaminergic pathways, serotonergic pathways, glutamatergic pathways, a whole lot of pathways that are involved in regulating our cognition and in our mood. It can also act, estradiol can also act on membrane bound estrogen receptors, which can also have actions on neurotransmitter pathways. Estrogen receptors and membrane bound estrogen receptors are located in brain regions that are critical to our thinking skills, our cognition, and our regulation of our emotions. For example, the prefrontal cortex at the front of our brains regulates executive functions and our capacity to organise and monitor our behaviour, plan, decision make, those sorts of skills. There's also a high density of estrogen receptors in the hippocampus, which is heavily involved in regulating our memory, and in the amygdala, which is really important for our emotion regulation. So collectively, estradiol has the potential to modulate our mood, influence our cognition, and also provide neuroprotection against um, inflammation and neuroprotection across our lifespan. So the influence of sex hormones across a female's lifespan actually begins in utero. So at a prenatal stage, males and females' brain development diverges. Males have this testosterone surge during weeks eight to weeks 24 gestation. And this is thought to contribute to differences in the way males and females' brains develop. So males' brains tend to have a right hemisphere dominance. And of all the research that's been done on sex differences in cognition, there's a lot of findings that are all over the place, but the one thing that tends to hold up is that males have a superior performance as a generalisation in visual spatial skills. So that's the thing that stands up in meta-analyses is this male dominance in visual spatial skills. So when I talk about visual spatial, the day-to-day -day best description is probably reading maps that is associated with male, um, males having better performance. In testing tasks, and you can try this out, this is the mental rotation task that's often used to demonstrate that males have a superior performance. So what you have to do is have a look at the box on your left 
and match it up to an image on your right. So you're mentally rotating this object. And so this has been traced back, this male um, benefit in this task has been traced back to this prenatal testosterone surge, which has, which has been linked to right hemisphere dominance in males. So after the first year of life, then um, moving back to this lifespan, the HPG axis that regulates these hex ho sex hormones remains relatively dormant until puberty. And then puberty is the second period where the brain is sensitive to these to changes in hormones and brain development again becomes sensitive to hormonal changes that occur during puberty. Following puberty for females, then there's a natural menstrual cycle where hormones fluctuate across the menstrual cycle or for some women a contraceptive pill which um, changes the natural menstrual cycle and adds in synthetic hormones. So both of these provide us with an opportunity to look at either exogenous or endogenous hormones and the impact that they may have on mood and cognition. Then for some women, there's a perinatal period which is associated with lots of hormonal changes. And for some women, following pregnancy, when estrogen levels drop straight after pregnancy, this is a period of vulnerability for either onset or relapse of depression or psychosis in some women. So some women are particularly sensitive to these hormonal changes. Then there's the menopause transition, which has a median age of 51, but the hormonal changes and some of the psychological changes can span up to 10 years. So this is another period of hormone sensitivity. And for some women, they become vulnerable to the effects of fluctuations and changes in sex hormones. And then following menopause, there's a, well, associated with menopause, there's a de um, decline in estrogen and progesterone, the ovarian hormones for women. And now with increased longevity, but no real change in the age at which menopause occurs, women are now spending a, a much larger portion of their lives in this postmenopausal period without the neuroprotection that some of the hormones like estrogen and progesterone might provide. Okay, so I'm gonna begin by focusing on some of the research that's been conducted by our team and by others, looking at the effects of menstrual cycle and contraceptive pill on mood and cognition. So the average menstrual cycle is about 25 to 31 days and the hormone fluctuations that occur over this menstrual cycle in research studies are often broken up into the follicular phase which is sometimes further broken up into an early or late follicular phase and as you can see the orange line is the estrogen which in the first red circle peaks and so this is where there's a heightened estrogen stage of the menstrual cycle and then the luteal phase in the second phase of the menstrual cycle which is associated with higher progesterone and slightly lower levels of estrogen. So the cognitive findings, the hypothesis is that verbal skills are enhanced during the follicular phase where estrogen levels are higher and then in the luteal phase where estrogen levels are lower there's supposed to be or hypothesized to be an enhancement of visual spatial type skills. But the actual studies and the systematic reviews have been conducted quite recently suggest that these are pretty subtle if, if at all. So the findings are inconsistent. So the cognitive fluctuations across the menstrual cycle are not very strong. But emotion and regulation and emotion processing, those findings are a bit more consistent. And in that luteal phase, emotion processing becomes poorer. 20% of women also report premenstrual symptoms in this luteal phase just prior to menstruation and about 5% of women experience particularly clinically disabling symptoms, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, so PMDD. And within our research team, we're really doing a lot of work this year to try and understand a lot more about why some women are particularly <coughs> sensitive to these hormonal fluctuations and develop these clinical symptoms prior to menstruation each month, which then resolves with the onset of menses. So I think there's a couple of honours students here today who are going to be investigating that over the course of this year. And we look forward to learning a lot more about the cognitive and emotion profiles associated with this, as well as we're collecting blood samples so we can learn more about what might underpin the diagnosis of PMDD and add to the existing body of literature. Okay, so moving on to the contraceptive pill. The findings that have been conducted looking at cognitive studies, and we've done a, a few of these um, studies over the years looking at cognition, have um, s suggested that verbal memory might be enhanced by potentially the estrogen component of the contraceptive pill. And visual spatial abilities seem to be linked to the type of progestin. So oral contraceptive pills 
or contain an estrogen and a progestin, a synthetic form of progesterone. And most of them contain the same type of estrogen. There's a couple of newer pills that have different type of synthetic estrogen. But the progestin component is quite varied. And the cognitive findings tend to assess those visual spatial, so that mental rotation or that um, mapping, those sorts of um, skills tend to improve with some types of progestin that have these androgenic effects, but tend to be impaired by some of the newer progestins that have this anti-androgenic um, anti -adrenergic pill types. So there might be some cognitive effects that are associated with the pill. Again, they're pretty subtle. What's more concerning is some of the mood changes that have been associated with the contraceptive pill. And um, Jay, she's done a lot of work in this area and I've joined her in some of the work. And the contraceptive pill in a subgroup of women is linked to depressive symptoms. So there was a big study that was published in JAMA Psychiatry two years ago that looked at over a Danish study that looked at over one million women. And they found that the use of the contraceptive pill was associated with antidepressant um, prescriptions and, and depression diagnoses. So there was a link made between contraceptive pill use and depression. Not in everyone, but a significant association was detected in this reg Danish registry of over one million women. They also found that this risk was heightened in adolescence. So there's a subgroup of people who are particularly vulnerable to the effects of these hormones on their mood. So I'm going to switch now to the menopause process and what the findings are in terms of cognition and mood. So as I mentioned before, menopause is a process where people transition from reproductive phase of their life into a postmenopausal phase. And the process and the hormonal changes associated with this process can span a 10 year period. So this perimenopause or this menopause transition in 20% of people is not associated with any symptoms, but in 80% of women, they experience some form of symptoms. And a subset of those women experience changes to their cognition and changes to their mood. So it's not everyone, but some people are particularly susceptible to these hormonal fluctuations and experience symptoms. The types of cognitive symptoms that people tend to experience are described as memory complaints. So people might describe forgetfulness or difficulties remembering things, difficulties organising things, not feeling as clear or as sharp. On objective testing, there can be a subtle decline in memory and attention in some of those executive function processes. And there probably hasn't been enough research conducted yet to know exactly what happens to cognition. The studies that have been published, there are only a few and they do suggest that cognition returns to normal levels postmenopausal. But because of um, Alzheimer's disease also having links to some of these sex steroid hormones, it's still unclear and there's different hypotheses in the literature about whether cognitive changes during menopause may or may not be associated with mild cognitive impairment or um, de cognitive decline later in life. So that's, uh, there's various hypotheses but no concrete evidence about that. So now I'm going to switch to um, schizophrenia, so a, a psychiatric illness, and talk a little bit about the role of hormones in schizophrenia. So schizophrenia is a severe and disabling mental illness that affects about 1% of the population worldwide. Despite this relatively low prevalence, schizophrenia has um, a disproportionate burden at a personal, at a societal, and at an economic level. The symptoms of schizophrenia are broadly broken up into positive symptoms and negative symptoms. So positive symptoms are things like hallucinations and delusions. Negative symptoms is a lack of emotion, a lack of feeling, a lack of volition. Disorganised symptoms, which can include bizarre and disorganised behaviour. And cognitive symptoms, which is what I'm particularly interested in, which are problems with learning, memory, organisation, decision making and problem solving. The cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia are a core feature of schizophrenia, so they're not a side effect of some of the positive symptoms or hallucinations or delusions. They're not a side effect of some of the antipsychotic medications. The cognitive symptoms are there at the onset of the illness and they remain during periods of clinical remission. Cognitive symptoms are directly related to functional outcomes and quality of life. So when antipsychotics work on some of the positive symptoms, people still have difficulties 
with their problem solving, decision making and memory and can find it quite difficult to engage in meaningful work, for example, or study or even relationships, day to day tasks. So at the moment, cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia respond poorly to current treatment options. So there's a need for cognitive enhancing treatments in schizophrenia and we wonder whether um, sex hormones could provide a benefit for cognition. So for a few decades now, there's been this hypothesis that oestrogen provides pr some sort of protection for people with schizophrenia. And some of this research has come from lifestyle studies that show the peak onset for males is a few years before, so in the first red circle, the peak onset for males is a few years before the peak onset in females, suggesting oestrogen in females might provide some sort of protection. And females with schizophrenia also have this second peak of onset which corresponds to menopause years. So when estrogen levels drop around menopause, there could be either a relapse or in this instance, a second um, peak of onset. There's also lifestyle studies showing that symptoms of schizophrenia can be exacerbated during the menstrual period when estrogen levels are lower, also following pregnancy when estrogen levels drop. So there's a few different lifestyle studies that have suggested that estrogen is implicated in the etiology of schizophrenia and might provide some sort of protective role. So on the back of these findings, um, Jaytree and our team, but Jaytree led these pioneering studies showing that estrogen treatments can help psychopathology in people with schizophrenia. So in women with schizophrenia, there was um, studies in estradiol and then these newer forms of estrogen, which are called selective estrogen receptor modulators, which act like estrogen a little bit in the brain. And Jaytree showing the effects on psychopathology and schizophrenia when added to antipsychotic medication. So then we were interested in cognition again. So wondering, first of all, whether there are links between the endocrine system in schizophrenia and cognitive function. So in a total of 244 women, we had a look at what menstrual cycle patterns were like and we noticed that 35% of women who were of a reproductive age, so having an age period where they um, should be having regular menstrual cycles, 35% of these women were experiencing irregular menstrual cycles, which may or may not be a result of antipsychotic medication, but if it's not just attributed to antipsychotic medication, um, it might be a marker of endocrine functioning. So we also noticed that this subgroup of women had poorer cognition than their uh, matched samples who had regular menstrual cycle, also with schizophrenia. So their cognition was particularly impaired. They had difficulties in areas such as semantic fluency, so that's word generation, verbal learning, so learning new verbal information, and psychomotor speed, which is a bit like reaction time. So we um, established this link between endocrine functioning and cognition in schizophrenia. And then we went back and looked at some of the data looking at raloxifen, which is this selective estrogen receptor modulator, an estrogen or hormone treatment, to see what it did to cognition. And we found that raloxifen, after we controlled for menopause status, it was a treatment for cognition in a subgroup of women with schizophrenia in certain areas of cognition, raloxifen could improve that. So there is potential for hormone treatments for cognitive dysfunction in schizophrenia. So I'm gonna go back to now to my take home message and hope that I've illustrated that sex hormones can influence mood and cognition in health and disease. Um, there's the capacity maybe for hormone treatments to provide novel treatment avenues in some psychiatric illnesses or neuropsychiatric illnesses and also to provide insight into the etiology of a whole range of different neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, we're particularly interested in why some women are sensitive to these hormone fluctuations. So we've got a range of studies, as I mentioned, in um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder as well as menopause to try and better understand what is going on in terms of hormone sensitivity. And I'd like to finish there by thanking the Women's Mental Health team in particular, um, Jayshree and the rest of the team, funding and collaborators. And just a quick plug, I'm on the local organising committee for the Society for Mental Health Research. So we've got a conference later this year. So I um, agreed to put a slide up and let everyone know about that in case anyone's interested. So thank you very much.